and praise the Lord. Are you excited to be in God's presence? Oh, yes, we ought to be because in his presence there is fullness of joy. And at his right hand is pleasure forevermore. It's a great privilege to be in God's presence once more as we continue on our study of the Word of God. As you know, the overall theme of uh, this year's camp meeting is saved by the grace of God. And uh, you have chosen to have saved by grace, you know, as your version of the theme. And uh, of course, we decided to do a study on salvation in the morning and also in the evening. And the evening series is uh, attacked, the gospel of the grace of God, the gospel of the grace of God. I'm actually uh, taking that uh, theme directly from uh, Acts chapter 20, verse number 24, the last point there that says to testify, to testify to the gospel of uh, the grace of God. It is interesting how in the morning we are actually looking at a series which is inspired by your theme text, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 to 10. And uh, Paul, in Acts chapter 20, verse 24, is actually addressing the elders or the pastors in Ephesus. Uh, it's interesting that we have the same audience receiving this book of Ephesians. Uh, my dear brothers and sisters, we uh, have looked at a couple of you know, topics in this uh, series. And basically, we see that the three angels messages of Revelation chapter number 14, verses 6 to 12, uh, call the word to respond to the gospel of the grace of God. Just as Jesus says in Mark chapter 1, verse 15, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. It is interesting how that the first angel's message of Revelation chapter number uh, 14, verses uh, 6 and 7, also has something to do with time. The hour of his judgment has come. And so you ought to respond to the gospel in view of the fact that you are in the time of the judgment, the time of what we call the uh, uh, great investigative uh, judgment or the day of uh, atonement. So the three angels call the world to respond to the gospel of uh, the grace of God. These three angelic uh, proclamations concern three vital things. Number one, the first angel's message is a proclamation concerning belief. The proclamation concerning belief, and that is in verses 6 and 7 of Revelation chapter 14. The second angel's message is a proclamation concerning Babylon. That is in verse number 8. And the last angel, or the third angel's message, is the proclamation concerning Babylon beast worshippers. That is in verses 9 to 11 of the book of Revelation chapter 14. Uh, we've looked at several topics in this series, the proclamation of peace for a planet imperial, and then we looked at the purpose of people or the purpose of life, then the period of litigation which we looked at on yesterday, you have the penalty for prostitution or the penalty of prostitution which we'll look at uh, today, and subsequently we will look at uh, taking precautions against the plagues, and then finally, the persevering people of God. Uh, so we've looked at proclamation of peace for people in peril based on the first angel's message, and then the purpose of life based on the first angel's message, and then the period of litigation uh, based on the first angel's message. And we considered on yesterday the period of litigation. We look at the purpose of uh, this litigation, okay, the purpose of this litigation. The Bible says, for the hour of his judgment has come. The hour of his judgment has come. And that's what we look at, you know, we also look at the period of this litigation, the period of this litigation. And finally, we look at how you can pass the litigation, how you can pass 
the litigation. All right, so today our topic is the penalty of prostitution. The penalty of uh, prostitution. Revelation chapter 14, verse number 8. Revelation chapter 14, verse number 8. We are done with verses 6 and 7. Uh, two verses which actually deal or which, um, uh, which, uh, in which the first angel's message is covered. Now we go into the second angel's message. Revelation chapter 14, verse number 8. Now as you flip the pages of your Bibles to Revelation 14, verse number 8, permit me to once more affirm my belief in the Bible as the Word of God. I believe in the primacy of the Bible, that the Bible is the ultimate authority. If you believe that, we mean say amen. I also believe the sufficiency of the Bible, that the Bible is sufficient to make one wise unto salvation. If you believe that, we mean can't let's say amen. And finally, I believe the totality of the Bible that all scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness that the man of God may be thoroughly furnished for all good works. If you believe that, we mean say amen to God. So our text is the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 14, verse number 8. Revelation chapter 14, verse number 8. The Bible says, And another angel followed, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she has made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath, of her fornication. Can you read that text again? Read it, please. Maybe you should read the text one more time. Ready, go. <laughs> I have no strength of my own, no wisdom of my own, no knowledge of my own, no power of my own. I ask that you put forth strength, give insight, and glorify yourself again. I pray, God, that you take away every obstruction, impediment to the declaration of your word, and that you will speak to us pointedly, powerfully, and personally. And as it has pleased you to use a frail, filthy, and feeble vessel as myself, I ask, O oh loving Father, that instead of speaking words of human wisdom to move the audience, humanity will diminish that divinity may dominate. Thank you, Father, for answered prayer. In the name of Jesus, let God's people say amen. The penalty of prostitution. The penalty of prostitution. As we critically expound the book of Revelation chapter 14, verse 8, I'm going to call your attention to three important things considering the topic, the penalty of prostitution the penalty of prostitution first of all we'll look at the corporate the corporate then we'll look at the consequence and finally we'll look at the crime the corporate the consequence and the crime let's go to the word of God first of all the corporate look at verse number eight with me the Bible says and another angel followed saying Babylon is falling, is falling, 
that great city because she has made the all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Take note of the name actually with the tower of Babel which was the first Babylon. It was built on the foundation of unbelief and defiance to God and it resulted in confusion. Babel as a matter of fact meant gate of the gods. Gate of the gods. And it was man's attempt to gain heaven by his own works. In other words, this first occurrence of Babylon suggests that these people were seeking to have salvation by works. This is counterfeit salvation. Counterfeit salvation. The next occurrence of Babylon is, of course, the most well-known Babylon of the Old Testament. And this was founded by King Nebuchadnezzar and his father, Nabopolassar. Okay? At the time of Daniel, and of course that was in 605 B.C. The, this particular Babylon was used by God in the beginning to discipline Judah and his people. But because Babylon took the glory, took the credit for her, her successes, you know, uh, uh, against the people of God and gave all the glory to her pagan deities, God actually decided to refuse them and uh, to deal with them. Now, because she also indulged in the sin of pride and uh, she thought herself to be equal with God. In fact, her priests were using the titles Pontifex Maximus. Pontifex Maxima, meaning the greatest breach maker. The greatest breach maker. And because she relied on the wisdom of sorcery and magic instead of the wisdom of God, she fell under the judgment of God. And so the Bible says Babylon was weighed in the balance and found wanting. Babylon is falling was actually predicted by the prophet Jeremiah in Jeremiah chapter 50 and Jeremiah chapter 51, which foretold the shocking fall of literal Babylon as well as the fall of apocalyptic Babylon as we find in the book of Revelation. So Babylon, as we know, as a city was the paradise with hanging gardens, one of the seven ancient wonders of the world. The city was laid out roughly in shape of square with a river running through it. When you think about a city in shape of square and a river running through it, what comes to mind? The new Jerusalem. The city full square with the river of life flowing through the city. So Babylon again was a counterfeit glorification, counterfeit heaven. So it is another example of fake faith, fake salvation or pseudo salvation. The next Babylon that is written in scripture is the New Testament Babylon. As a matter of fact, there are several references to symbolic Babylon in the New Testament because in his uh, day, Rome was the oppressor of God's people. They were defiant towards God's principle or the kingdom principle. Peter is the one who referred to Rome as Babylon. And that is in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 13. Peter refers to Rome as Babylon. In other words, this represents the rejection of God's means of salvation. The rejection of God's means of salvation. Remember, at this time, Rome was in its pagan state. It will later on metamorphose into its, you know, uh, uh, what you call paper, you know, state. So what does Babylon represent, dear brothers and sisters? Religious confusion, false doctrines, and salvation by works. Salvation by works, fake means of attaining rightness with God or salvation. Dear brothers and sisters, later on, like I pointed out, the system of the papacy fits all of the prophetic specifications given in Revelation chapter 13 and Revelation chapter 17. And therefore, the system of the papacy, the Roman church, is therefore Babylon. 
Babylon is mentioned in the book of Revelation six times. Six occurrences of Babylon in the book of Revelation. You find them in chapter 4, chapter 60, chapter 14 rather, chapter 16, chapter 17, and chapter 18. And in these four chapters, 16, uh, uh, 14, 17, and 18, there are actually two symbolisms under which this city or this uh, 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 entity is actually presented. Number one, there is the symbolism of the city. Number two, there is the symbolism of the woman. The symbolism of the city. The city of Babylon is actually the opposite of the new Jerusalem. And then the woman Babylon is the opposite of the maid of Christ. The woman who actually has stars on her head, who is covered with the sun and so on, representing God's people. Brothers and sisters, in Revelation 14, 8, Revelation 14, 8, we see that Babylon's fall is declared. Babylon's fall is declared in Revelation 14, 8. In Revelation 16, 19, Babylon is divided. Revelation 16, 19, Babylon is divided. John sees this end time system split into parts. Revelation 16, 19. In other words, the satanic correlation will experience its unavoidable collapse. This is part of God's judgment. So we see Babylon's fall is declared. Revelation 14, Revelation 16, Babylon is divided. Then in Revelation 17, Babylon is described. Then in Revelation 18, Babylon is destroyed. Declared, divided. Described, destroyed. Come with me, brothers and sisters, to Revelation 17, where the Bible describes for us the corporate. Notice what the Bible says, Revelation chapter number 17, verses 1 and 2 and 4. The Bible says this woman commits adultery with both the potentates and the people of this earth. She is a great prostitute with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication. Fornication in the Old Testament is used often as a metaphor for alliances between the apostate cities and the nations. God's people enter into alliances with apostate cities and nations. Therefore, for instance, Isaiah called Tyre, a city that played hallowed with all the kingdoms on the face of the earth. Isaiah 23, verse number 17. Nahum announced the judgment on Nineveh because of the many harlotries of her harlot, who sells nations by her harlotries and families by her sorceries. That is in Nahum chapter uh, 3, verse number 4. So the language of fornication is used with reference to the relationship between Israel and the surrounding nation. For instance, Isaiah moons that the faithful city had become a harlot. Isaiah chapter 1, verse number 21. Jeremiah speaks of Israel as a harlot with many lovers. Jeremiah chapter 3, verse number 1. Ezekiel mentions Israel playing the harlot with many nations, including Egypt, Assyria, and even the Chaldeans. Ezekiel chapter 16, verses 26 to 29. Brothers and sisters. It appears that John's description of the great prostitute in Revelation 17 verses 1 to 6 reflects the image of the figure of the Queen Jezebel we serve as a model of Jeremiah's portrayal of faithless Jerusalem. The portrayal of the union between Anton Babylon and the governing political powers of the world in Revelation chapter number 17 and chapter number 18 built on this Old Testament imagery. So the first thing about her is her corruption. She is a prostitute. She says blasphemous things about God. Blasphemy in the New Testament refers to acts of claiming equality with God as well as claiming the prerogatives of God. Babylon is blasphemous as well. It is a false church wearing purple and scarlet and glittering with gold and precious stones and pearls. This is an utterly materialistic system. Brothers and sisters, the Bible also tells us after her corruption, the Bible tells us about her compromise. 
The Bible says this culprit of the crime of fornication has aligned herself with the godless political system of this world. I'm talking about the culprit of the crime of post, uh, prostitution. This false church power controls what the Bible calls the scarlet beast. Now, a beast in the Bible prophecy represents kingdom or political power. Daniel chapter 7 verse 17 and also verse number 23. So this is the same beast as described in Revelation chapter 13 verses 1 to 8. It has seven heads and ten horns and it is covered with blasphemous name. It is depicting what is in Revelation chapter number 13. In Revelation 13, it is portrayed as an amalgamation of political and religious power. In Revelation 17 and Revelation 18, the distinction between the religious and political is clearly defined. Punishment is first di directed upon those who have actually the greatest opportunities. As we look at this woman, we have seen her corruption. We have seen her compromise. But the Bible also gives us her caption. Her caption. Chapter 17, verse number 5, the Bible says, On her forehead is written, Babylon the great, mother of all prostitutes and obscenities of the world. This woman is a prostitute of the highest standard. She is the mother, in fact, of prostitutes, or if you like, she's the mother of churches that have compromised the truth and have turned from God. She is the mother of abomination. She is the mother of false worship. Brothers and sisters, Mr. Babylon has promoted the sacrifice of truth on the altar of tradition. Mystery Babylon has said, it is not by grace alone, but by grace and work we are saved. Mystery Babylon has said, it is not by faith alone, but by faith and work we are saved. Mystery Babylon has said, it is not God alone who takes the glory for our salvation. We share the glory with him. Mystery Babylon has promoted penance indulgence and all manner of sinister and unbiblical doctrines she is the mother of prostitutes brothers and sisters jesus christ said by her teaching she misleads my servants into sexual immorality and the eating of food sacrificed to idols revelation chapter 2 verse number 20 so babylon although it claims to be the true church is actually a fallen church well, brothers and sisters, we see her caption, mother of Harlot. But we also see her cruelty. Revelation 17 verse 6, her cruelty. The Bible says she is drunk with the blood of the martyrs she has murdered. This is a persecuting power. This mother of false churches controls multitudes with its false teachings and Burnt out a stick by her, left to rot in dungeons by her, terribly slandered by her. People have been murdered by her. She is a persecuting power. During the dark ages, millions and millions were killed by her. She created a whole department of the church. It is called the Department of the Inquisition, where many who rejected the teachings of the church were killed at the stake, burned for their faith. She is a persecuting power. Now, if you begin from verse number 7 of Revelation chapter 17, John sees some things about this woman. The Bible tells us that he sees a woman riding on a beast with seven heads and ten horns. Seven heads and ten horns? You see, the symbol of the beast stands for political power that stand in service to enter Babylon in the last days. So this religious power is riding on political power. In other words, this beast of political power is revived after being brought to an end and comes up out of the abyss according to the Bible. And even though it received a potentially fitter one, this beast is active again in the last days. As we see in Revelation chapter number 13, verse number 3. 
But brothers and sisters, this woman rides on scarlet beast. John saw this. Then John also heard some things. In John, um, in Revelation chapter 17, verses 8 to 18, John says that a woman represents, he was given that interpretation, that the woman represents a corrupt religious system depicted by the city Babylon. This woman, John sees, is a corrupt religious system. Now what is John told in 8 to 18 of Revelation 17? John is told the meaning of the seven heads. What's the meaning of the seven heads? Brothers and sisters, this has to do with all of the powers that the devil has used against the people of God. Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, Medo Persia, Greece, Rome in John's day, and the political arm of falling Babylon. Seven heads, seven kings. My dear brothers and sisters, he's also told the meaning of waters. He is told that waters represents people represents people. The Bible says the waters which you saw, there where the hallowed sits are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. This is a global power. It is a people, you know, a, a dominated power. John is also told the meaning of the ten horns. John is told the meaning of the ten horns. He is told that the ten horns which you saw are ten kings who have received no kingdom as yet. And then John is also told that the kings will destroy the woman, but will themselves be destroyed by the lamb. The ten kings represent the final summit of the political power of falling church. Just before its destruction and the end of the world, this union only exists for a short time before the destruction of the world. And then the Bible says these kings will destroy the woman because they will realize she had deluded them. She had misled them. She had made them to follow a wrong means of seeking salvation. And they realize that it's too late. Too late. And they turn on the woman and begin to destroy her. Dear brothers and sisters, we see as we discuss the topic, the penalty of prostitution. The corporate who has committed this penalty, or who has committed this crime rather, and deserved this penalty, is the apostate church. The corporate is a false religious system. The corporate is a system that is seeking salvation by human means. A system that is seeking salvation by works. Well, we have seen the corporate now let's go to the text. The Bible gives us the consequence. The consequence. The Bible says in verse number 8, Babylon is falling. It's falling. Oh, my dear brothers and sisters, the repeated verb falling in the Greek is in the oris announcing a future event. The futuristic use of the oris in the Hebrew prophecy is known as the prophetic perfect in which a future event is described, okay, with the past tense as if that had already occurred. And that is what John seems to be applying here. So in the text, the fall of Anton Babylon to take place in the future is announced as if it had already happened. That is the way of saying prophetically that this will definitely come to pass. Babylon is falling. It's falling. And dear brothers and sisters, remember, in Revelation 17, Babylon is described. In Revelation 18, Babylon is destroyed. Babylon is destroyed. The Bible says in Revelation 18, 1, an angel with great authority and splendor announces Babylon's destruction. And what is the remover? Revelation 18, 4, the Bible says, God orders his people to leave this corrupt city. So the angel says, Babylon is falling, is falling. Then he says, come out of hell, my people. Come out of her, believers. Come out of her, people of God. Come out of her, those who are sincerely seeking for truth. Come out of her, that you be not partaker of her plagues. So there is a remover. In other words, there is a call for all of God's people who are in a religious system that is based on falsehood and teaching wrong means of salvation to come out. 
And then as we go on in Revelation chapter 18, verses 6, 8, 10, 17, and 19, the Bible tells us about the retribution of Babylon. The retribution of Babylon. First of all, the removal. Secondly, the retribution. The Bible tells us about the severity of this destruction. Chapter 18, verse number 6, she is giving double punishment for all her evil deeds. Revelation 18, 8, and 10, and 17, and 19, we see the suddenness of this destruction. Fire comes from heaven, consumes the city in a single moment, in a single moment. Babylon, oh, that great city is consumed with fire. That is the retribution, but we also see the reaction. What is the reaction? Chapter 18, verses 9, 10, 11 to 16, and 17 to 19 and 20. The Bible tells us about the reaction of people to the fall of Babylon. Number one, there is great remorse by the unsaved. The unsaved is remorseful that Babylon had been destroyed. Chapter 18, verses 9 to 10 and 11 to 19. And the Bible tells us what the merchants of the world cry out. They cry out saying, how terrible, how terrible for Babylon, that great city. Then we see that they cry out. Why did they cry out? The Bible says, because there is no one left to buy their, 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 their cargoes of precious metals, clothing, wood, ivory, brass, iron, marble, uh, perfume, food, cattle, and even human slaves. The unsaved cry over Babylon's demise. But the Bible tells us that for the saved, there is rejoicing. Chapter 18, verse number 20, the Bible tells us that the saved rejoice over Babylon's fall. And then we go on to the result, the retribution, the removal, and we see the results. Chapter 18, verses 21 to 23, uh, 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 notice what the Bible says. Because of the destruction of Babylon, the Bible says no sound of music is in Babylon anymore. Chapter 18, verses 21 to 22. The Bible says no industry is in Babylon anymore. Chapter 18, verse 22. The Bible says no light is in Babylon anymore. Chapter 18, verse 23. The Bible says no joyous weddings in Babylon anymore. Chapter 18, verse 23. Brothers and sisters, Babylon comes, stole, and in glory. Glorious demise. We see the corporate. The corporate is a false religious system. The corporate is not just a false religious system. It is a false religious system influencing other false religious systems. And then we see the penalty. We see the, 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 the consequence. She's finally destroyed. Babylon is destroyed. But the question is, why is Babylon destroyed? Notice what the Bible says. This takes us to the third and final point. The crime. The corporate. The consequence. The crime. Someone who wants to know, why would God destroy this system? Why has God destroyed these people? The answer is the crime. Chapter 14, verse number 8, notice what the Bible says. The Bible says, and another angel followed, saying, Babylon is falling, is falling. That great city, now you got it. Because she has made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. That is Babylon's crime. Babylon does not only commit fornication with the kings of the earth. But she makes nations to drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. So first, brothers and sisters, in the Old Testament, ancient Babylon is portrayed by the prophet Jeremiah in terms of a prostitute that is seducing a man into immorality by making him drink wine. For instance, Babylon is the cup, according to Jeremiah 25, verse number 15. Babylon is the cup of the wine of the wrath in God's hand, urging all nations to drink of it. Furthermore, Job says of the evil man, notice now, Job 21, verse number 20, let him drink of the wrath of the Almighty. So in the book of Revelation, chapter 14, verse number 8, the acceptance of Babylon's seducive or seductive wine of fornication results in the drinking of the wine of the wrath of God. In other words, deception leads 
to destruction. If you follow Babylon's deceptive doctrines, deceptive belief system, deceptive means of being saved, your ultimate end is destruction. And Babylon is an instigator. Babylon is the one who initiates. Babylon is this evil system. Well, brothers and sisters, as we look at Revelation chapter 18, verses 2 to 3, 5, 7, 13, 23 to 24, the Bible tells us why Babylon has fallen. If you look at all of those passages, especially Revelation 18, 1 to 3, you'll notice that there is the spiritual reason. There is the doctrinal reason. There is the political reason. And there is the material reason. As you look at all of these, the Bible says in chapter 18, verse 2, it has become a den of demons. Babylon is destroyed because it became a den of demons. Babylon is destroyed, chapter 18, verse 3, because it is filled with immorality. Babylon is destroyed, chapter 18, verse 3, because it is materialistic to the core. Babylon is destroyed, chapter 18, verse number 5, its sins are as high as the heavens. Revelation 18, verse 7, Babylon is destroyed because it is totally proud and arrogant. Well, brothers and sisters, chapter 18, verses 23 to 24, Babylon is destroyed because it has deceived the nations and it has killed the people of God. And then in Revelation chapter 18, verse number 13, Babylon is destroyed for buying and selling human slaves. Oh, my dear brothers and sisters, the message is simple. The penalty of prostitution. The penalty of prostitution. And so, as we consider this critical legal issue, you need to know the culprit. The culprit who is culpable, the culprit who is liable for the crime of fornication is Babylon. And Babylon represents the apostate church. Babylon represents Catholicism. Babylon is not just an apostate church. She is the mother of apostatism. She is the mother of apostasies. She is the mother of all false churches. That's the culprit. What is her crime? What is her crime? What is the consequence? The Bible tells us the consequence before the crime. Consequence, God destroyed her. Babylon will be destroyed. But why? Religious reason, political reason, moral reason, social reason, spiritual reason. Dear brothers and sisters, here is the point. We are discussing the gospel of the grace of God. And you got to pick this up. Babylon symbolizes the wrong means of salvation. Seeking salvation by self efforts, by works. That's what Babylon represents. And Babylon is teaching this doctrine to the rest of the world. If you follow this system of work, this system of attaining salvation by works, this system of attaining salvation by penance, by indulgence, by attaining salvation, by sharing the glory of God, or doing meritorious work, the end is destruction. We come back again to Ephesians. For by grace, we have been saved. Through faith, not of works, lest any man should boast. Not of yourselves, it is a gift of God. Not of works, lest anyone should boast. My dear brothers and sisters, the Bible says by the works of the law shall no man be justified. I leave it to you tonight to decide whether to follow God's sole means of salvation. Salvation initiated by him, applied by him, and he ultimately takes the glory for it or to follow Satan's counterfeit salvation the penalty of prostitution My dear brothers and sisters as we wrap up the bible tells us that babylon made many to drink of the cup 
of God's wrath. The undiluted, the unmixed wrath of God. Brothers and sisters, the truth is, you don't need to drink of that cup. No, you don't. You don't. You don't have to drink the cup of God's wrath. Because somebody has already taken the cup of the wrath of God. And that person is Jesus Christ. Who drank the cup of God's wrath for you and for me. The Bible says in Luke 22, verse 42. Father, if thou art willing, remove this cup from me. Yet not my will, but thou be done. That cup is the wrath of God. The Bible says God spared not his son, but gave him over to die. That is the wrath of God. The Bible says as his son stood between heaven and earth, he yelled, Elah, Elah, Labman Sabbatini. That is the wrath. He was separated from God spiritually. He was completely separated from God. It was an excruciating, painful experience. He died of a broken heart. That was the wrath of God. John 18 verse 11. Jesus therefore said to Peter, put the sword away, the cup which the Father has given me. Shall I not drink it? Shall I not drink it? Jesus drank the cup of the wrath of God. He drank the undiluted wrath of God. He drank the unmixed wrath of God. And brothers and sisters, the reason is so that you will not have to drink of that cup anymore. Wrath has passed over us. The Bible says we have been passed from death into life. We are free if we are in Christ Jesus. The message is simple. Don't follow a religious system that gives a means of salvation which is fake. And the only true means of salvation is for by grace you have been saved through faith and not of yourselves it is a gift of God that's it Adventists we are saved by grace any system that gives a work based salvation is a fixed system it's a fixed system may God help us let us all stand as we pray Brothers and sisters, we are in the conflict of the ages. And there are only two groups. Those who follow the devil's fake or counterfeit salvation. And those who follow God's only means of salvation. And those who are in religious systems that say you can work for your salvation. To you God says, Babylon is falling. Come out of her my people. I feel strongly that there may be someone here who has been thinking that all the little things they've been doing for God are meritorious. It can gain them access to God. It can give them rightness of God. It can save them. God doesn't want you to go that path. You are saved by grace alone. You are saved by grace alone. And so God wants you to embrace this salvation which only Him offers for us freely, freely, freely. Can we sing the theme song? That's going to be the closing song just before our prayer. Our theme song which is um, Redeem. I like that. Redeem how I love to proclaim it. We're going to sing that song. Redeem how I love to proclaim it. Listen intently to the words of that song. And you will discover that we are redeemed not by silver or gold or other perishable things, but by the precious, priceless blood of Jesus. Let's sing that song together.
Come and sing up all your heart. Redeem. continue to sing. I'm going to call two groups. The first group are those who want to appreciate the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. He said, Father, I'm grateful for this salvation. It is a great salvation. You say, Father, thank you for your salvation. Just lift up your hand. The next group I'm going to call are those who want to appropriate the salvation. For the first time, you want to apply the merits of the cross to your heart and your life that you might be saved by the grace of God. Wave your hand as well as we continue singing that song. Redeem. Yes, Lord. I shall see his beauty. Low and delight. several of you if you feel strongly God is calling you to be baptized you can meet with us after the service several of you have already made that decision I was amazed yesterday as I step outside his sister walked to me and said pastor I feel God is asking me to be baptized and I know several of you are making that decision tomorrow we're going to carry out baptism and you want to be a part of it just meet with us we're going to do an interview with you on tomorrow to prepare you for bap baptism. That's going to be at 9 a.m. We're going to do that interview and then we're going to carry out the baptism. You want to be part of it. Baptism is your outward profession of what has happened in your heart. It is identifying with Jesus in his death, his burial, and his resurrection. For you, it's going to be resurrection to the newness of life. So meet with us after the service as we prepare you for baptism on Friday. Father in heaven, what a mighty word. All four systems of salvation will lead to destruction. The only true system of salvation is that which sees Christ as the only contributor to our salvation. That which lifts Jesus high. That which is influenced by the stream of eternal life that flows from Calvary. Help us, a loving Father, to seek this and this alone. We honor you. We give you all the glory for saving us by the only true means of salvation. By grace, through faith, not of ourselves. It is the gift of God. Not of works, lest any man, any Adventist, any Christian, any elder, any pastor should boast. Forbid it, Lord, that we should boast except in the cross 
of Christ, our substitute. Be honored, Father. In Jesus' name, amen.